Hey guys. Um, I'm a bit of a walker, so if you don't mind, I'll use the handheld. But everyone take a deep breath, because we're going to talk about toilets, okay? We're going we're gonna to get into the nitty gritty of what it's all about when you actually use our product every single day, at least four or five times a day. <laughs> and my expectation is, is that after this conversation, you're going to have a lot of very unusual questions for me about how toilets really work. Um, so let me tell you about the sustainable story and the kinds of things that we're doing at Toto to bring this issue to the forefront. Uh, first and foremost, just a quick picture of who we are. We're, we're about a $5 billion a year company out of Japan. We're the largest plumbing manufacturing company of sanitary ware around the world. Um, but what is probably most interesting for us is that we have about 1,500 R&D engineers in Japan uh, who do nothing but dream up crazy things that you can do with toilets. <laughs> Some of them are pretty crazy, but some of them are quite innovative and, and really brings a very clever solution to that space that you wouldn't have thought would have been possible. And I'll touch upon a few of those as I go through my conversation uh, this afternoon. So um, here we are in the United States. Now, we produce products in the US. When I joined the company back in 2003, 70% of everything we sold in the United States, we bought in from Asia from our manufacturing sources in Asia. We're a Japanese company, we're very Asian-centric. But over the years, and up until 2012, 2013, 2014, now about 73% of everything we sell in the US comes from North America. We have found that the increased costs of manufacturing and procurement of products and services out of the Asian continent has become so expensive that it doesn't make sense for us anymore to use Asian supply sources. We will use and have been using, and in fact, our, our new one-piece toilets that we've had in the marketplace for now many years, that one-piece toilet I can make in Atlanta, Georgia, cheaper than I can buy it from my best factory in Beijing and ship it over. Buy a lot. So I don't need Asia, I don't need China. In fact, this process has actually changed the way we do site selection and factory build outs today. Today we build a factory in India for India. Today we build a factory in Indonesia for Indonesia. We build a factory in Mexico for Mexico and a little bit into the US. We build a factory in Brazil for Brazil. So we're finding that the opportunities to build smaller, more nimble factories that are capable and competent to produce products that are unique for that particular part of the world is the more appropriate and sustainable practice to use going forward. Now, you'll see here we've got manufacturing facilities where we produce pint urinals, we produce one-piece toilets. Uh, most of our products are moving into the 1.28 WaterSense program. Um, and in fact, uh, we have a manufacturing facility located in uh, Mexico as well, where we're producing about uh, 40,000 pieces a month. Now, in Atlanta, I make 20,000 toilets a month in that factory. 20,000 toilets a month, and I can't make any more, and the demand is growing. We are absolutely full at this moment, and have been, quite frankly, for the past 18 months. Smack full. As soon as we build it, it's shipping to somebody. So that demand curve has been very nice for us, even at a time when the housing market is still a little bit in turmoil and has not fully recovered. Now, what's been happening primarily for us is, you know, and, 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 and we've been doing LCA work since about 2008. We've been doing LCA work as a way to begin to measure the impacts. Because in manufacturing, and especially in a Japanese company, when you measure it, you can control it. When you measure it, you can understand it. We really began to look at LCAs as a way to measure and understand the impactfulness of the decisions we make about our products. And what was most interesting was that during that process of analyzing the cradle to grave process, from the time that we mine the clay from the ground to the time that the product is fired and produced in our, our factory in Atlanta, to the time that we actually transport it, ship it, and put it in the home, even to the end of life and how we recycle and bring those products back out of the house and recover them into a recycling stream, all of those channels and all of those impacts were measured including probably the most important one that we had not considered before was the embedded energy content in a gallon of water. 
we actually dove into and got very deep into the water energy nexus and understanding that within every gallon of water, effectively, for that portable water that you bring into your home and use, 0 0.0037 kilowatts per gallon of water is embedded in that water. Now, I guarantee it's a whole lot more in California, right? <laughs> You're going into LA, and just a bit less in Chicago where they stick a straw in the Lake Michigan. But undoubtedly, there is an embedded energy content. And what that gave us an opportunity to do was to understand where the impacts were and what do we need to do to really begin to draw down that impact and understand where we need to put our resources. So when we did that analysis, we found out that 53% of our total LCA impact was in the use phase in the home or in the business where that product would reside. So our very first effort toward attacking that process was to go after water conservation. We adopted and wrapped our arms so tight around water sense it made EPA's head blow up. And it's most important because I, I gotta tell you, you know, EPA sometimes gets a, a bad rap and they do some pretty goofy things sometimes, but I'll tell you this, when they engaged in the water sense program, they did a spectacular process. They actually engaged all of the stakeholders in the analysis and the characteristics of what the EPA water sense standard needed to be to reduce consumption. They engaged stakeholders that were advocates, river keepers, the Sierra Club, the manufacturers, municipalities, end users, all were on panels and committees to develop a standard that would become the voluntary water sense program. And that water sense program took us from a 1.6 gallon toilet, for example, down to a 1.28. And now we've even gone below that down to one gallon flush toilets. Now, quite frankly, we believe that one gallon with the current infrastructure, the current paradigm of how to use water to flush toilets is about as low as you can go and still be able to use the embedded infrastructure of the drain line carry so that you don't cause clogging in your drain lines. And that's a bit of a problem. In fact, it's such a problem that we're actually inviting some of the folks that make paper products to come in and have very detailed conversations with us about how they produce paper products to make that paper product able to be better, if you will, macerated when you flush the toilet to dissolve and break up into a slurry as opposed to a clump. Now, we're a toilet company, right? Why are we thinking about toilet paper manufacturing? It's part of our business. It's part of our effort to make sure we engage all of our stakeholders. Now, we even got into one pint urinals and, and engaged in that process. We actually uh, looked at not only one pint urinals, but we also looked at how to understand as you reduce that water impact, what does it do to your carbon footprint? That was our first attempt. 2008, 2009, 2010, we were measuring carbon footprint for the sake of understanding carbon footprint. And not that we published it, not that we pushed it around in the marketplace to say, well, we're doing LCAs. We used it as a way of measuring the success of our process. And as you can see, we started out at 1.6, about 464 pounds of carbon to make a, a toilet. And since that time, through both water reduction as well as higher recycled content on our cardboard, looking at the way we package and ship product, understanding how we can make the product lighter and smaller, we're down to 350 pounds of carbon. You know, that's a pretty fair approach in, in taking down the impacts. Where can we get some more opportunities? Well, the next step for us is making sure that as we take down that carbon content that we help portray that transparency to our customer. We didn't have that opportunity a couple of years ago. And so as we look at all the things that we do in our manufacturing process, including, by the way, we also use UPS folks. In fact, Toto was the first company in the world to engage UPS in carbon neutral shipments. Now, we often talk about, well, what's the benefit of doing all these green things, right? Yes, it gets us some notoriety. It gets us some people talking about it. But I mean, actually UPS came and shot a video at our factory of us talking about this, and they made a case study that UPS then put into the brochure that they took to every one of their customers. When they went to a customer and said, you need to use UPS, don't use those FedEx guys, use UPS, here's who we are. They'd open up that bifold, and they had some case studies in there. And whose case study was on the front? Smiling, talking about what we're doing with UPS? Toto. And as a result of that, the unintended consequence was to actually turn UPS into a total salesperson. And that's wonderful, right? 
what a great opportunity to have someone else be your advocate, be your salesperson, and I don't pay them. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. Now, there's also an approach we use, and, and I call it the silver bullet approach. You know, we've talked a lot today about all these different approaches. You know, my contention is that people start looking at the issues of how to, how to kill this beast. How do we knock down this issue of sustainability and improving what we do in the world? And, and everyone's sort of looking for that one silver bullet, one, one big thing in place. I, I contend there's no silver bullet. There's a silver buckshot instead, which means lots and lots of little silver solutions over time become cumulative and impactful. And in some cases, the silver buckshot will miss. It will miss the target. That's okay. Sometimes it will hit the target, but not so, so square in the chest. That's okay too. Some will hit it right square in the chest. That's a wonderful thing. So what are we doing to make sure we have a culture where we actually engage in, in putting in lots and lots of opportunities for change and trying things out that in some cases don't work? We tried, for example, to, to mitigate our waste stream to landfill, the C&D landfill. When we produce our toilets out of the kiln, we have a percentage of the product that doesn't make quality grade. Our first process was to actually break it up into small pieces and try to put it into the oyster beds off the coast of Georgia. Because when you harvest oysters off the oyster beds, you strip the oyster bed, you make it sterile. Because the next generation of oysters want to propagate on the previous generation's shells. And so if you strip the shell bed, it's sterile. So we actually would take bags, nylon bags, filled with porcelain, put them on the oyster beds, and they would actually begin to propagate. But in Georgia, we have tidal beds, which means part of the day, the water is above the bed, part of the day, the bed's exposed because the water drops down. And it wasn't so good for beachcombers to walk along the beach and see nylon bags full of total to toilets broken up as they would walk by the beach. So that one didn't work. But then we went to actually <laughs> taking, that, taking that process and looking at it to use for roadbed construction and making our broken pieces of the toilet, crush them up, and add it to the granite aggregate base that folks like Martin Marietta would sell to the roadbed manufacturers and, and the municipalities to build roadbeds and backfill for buildings. That was a, a pretty good solution. And that worked out pretty well for us for a couple of years. But then we found a partnership with a company called Crossville Tile, where we now take every single bit of our porcelain that we break up, that we don't have making quality grade, we crush it up, we take it up to Crossville, Tennessee, and they make ceramic floor tile out of it. So we've completely upcycled our waste stream into a raw material to support their process. Now, all of that has helped us move to a darker shade of green. And as we move all of those processes down, including landfill, methane gas, I mean, we even do crazy things like the hydraulic oil, the hydrocarbon-based hydraulic oil in a fork truck to move the forks up and down, we took it out. We put soybean oil in instead because I'd rather get my oil from a farmer in Iowa than from the Gulf of Mexico. Now, is it hugely impactful? Absolutely not. Does it have an opportunity to show the ethic and the principles of our business? Absolutely. And it's been great for our employee base as well. Now, we even use biomimicry to design a trapway in a urinal. We went through a whole big long process to actually understand, do you even know what an oxbow is? An oxbow is that funky little lake that occurs on an alluvial plain on the river when it meanders. And what is interesting about that is that as the river flows around the turn in the, uh, in the river, the meander, it flows faster on the outside than on the inside. And we found out that a standard U-shaped trapway was not very efficient because it caused turbulent flow and viscous shear. Kind of in the weeds. But in, in the opportunity to understand that hydrodynamic characteristic, it gave us an opportunity to redesign a product using biomimicry, understanding the natural environment, and thus build a better urinal. That's what we need to do as a business. Now, as we, we got a little bit further into this process, we even generated, who, who's had a chance to actually test drive a total washlet bidet? Who's actually set, uh, you guys have not lived, till so you've set on a heated seat with a remote control that will rinse you off when you're done, and it is unbelievable the experience that you'll have on that. First time you do it, it's like, whoa. Uh, but after you begin to use it, it's really quite a wonderful experience. But what is most important is this. The ability to integrate electronics into a toilet seat to make a bidet functionality to reduce, number one, the amount of toilet paper you use when you flush, because now, you're not using it to wipe and wipe and wipe and clean. 
you're using it maybe dry off, and that's it. You use a much smaller amount of toilet paper. Number two, you're a whole lot cleaner when you get off the bowl, right? And number three, it's an also an opportunity to add some very interesting technologies to a toilet seat. In fact, this product now, we've made it so clever that when it's, now as you can imagine, as we take water in the toilet bowl and begin to reduce the amount of water in a flush, right? You continually reduce that water and the water spot, that little pond of water when you walk up to the bowl, gets smaller and smaller. Now when you go to the toilet and you use the, you sit down and you make a solid visit, there's an opportunity for you to be exposed to a lot of dry porcelain. And dry porcelain has this very interesting co uh, characteristic called the coefficient of friction. And there's a, a, a theory called stiction, which is the characteristics of two surfaces and how they interact and the stickiness of those surfaces. Well, if you have dry porcelain, you're going to get a higher incidence of skid marks. Now, as you walk up to this toilet seat, it actually sees you coming. And what it will do with that large dry porcelain surface, it will actually shoot a spray of water onto the bowl surface. It will pre-moisten, pre-wet the surface. So guess what? It's now slippery. It's not going to have as much stiction and the coefficient of friction has been changed. And after that, after you get done and you sit down, take care of business, press the remote control, rinse off, woohoo, right? After all that process is done, we actually have this bidet toilet seat will actually use an anode and cathode. It will run portable water across the anode and cathode and create electrolyzed water that will then rinse and clean the bowl. Now, it won't clean it perfectly, and you can't not go a whole year without cleaning your toilet bowl, but you can reduce the frequency of the cleaning that you do, and you can reduce the, the harmfulness or, or strength of the materials you use to clean your bowl, which means that we've had a positive impact on the environmental attributes of how this bowl lives in the space that you're going to put it into. Now, it gets even better. As we go into lead version four, right? We recognized early on, and as you heard from Terry and you've heard from Mark and the others, that you know, this lead version 4 presents some very interesting challenges to the marketplace. Environmental product declarations are the fundamental characteristic that we're looking at right now as we transition from 2009 to lead version 4. Now, we were already doing LCAs, and we were able to begin to incorporate and take those LCAs, embed them into sustainable mines, and we actually looked very closely at what was required to provide the information necessary to meet the requirements of lead version 4. And we said, you know, we can go with a full EPD, develop the PCRs, and do all that canoodle, or we can just generate a transparency report, which was basically reporting on our LCA. Our LCA is full, ISO 14044, certified, verified, and approved. And in fact, our transparency report, I believe today, is faster to market, cheaper to implement, and more discernible or understandable by the individuals, the consumers who are looking at that document. For me, that's the most important thing for that document to have. Now, as we got into the weeds here, you know, we began our relationship um, early on with, with Paul and the Eco Scorecard team because we actually took our BIM model, of which we've got about 650 or so models under BIM right now, that's a lot of stuff in BIM. Uh, and we have maybe 200 of them are eco scorecarded out. All of this information you see here is all of the information that was the base requirements to satisfy 2009 lead. You pull the BIM model in, that's what you want to put in. You import it into your, your rivet file, you press the print button, it prints that, that document out, put in the three ring binder, USGBC, here you go, God bless you, give me a, give me a badge. You put it on the building. I mean, look like it's really important. But most importantly here is we were able to meet the base requirements. But remember, during this whole time, we're still running LCAs. Now, I believe today's consumers are becoming more and more concerned about transparency. And I believe also that today's consumers want to be sure that they understand the businesses and companies they do business with, does it align with the eth ethics that I have? And if it doesn't necessarily align with my ethics, does it help me maybe reach my aspirational ethic that I want to get to? There are many people who are making choices about the products they buy because they feel good about the company they're buying from. And if it makes them feel good, 
they're going to buy it even though the price may be a little bit higher, even though the product may not satisfy all their needs. Apple is a great example. People still line up for every new version of Apple iPhone that comes out, like they're going to an Aerosmith concert or something, right? And, and they get crazy about that. So we want to make our product aspirational. We want to make it the kind of product that people say, yes, Toto's doing the right kinds of things. They're providing that thought leadership and bringing the solutions to the market, helping people achieve those aspirational goals and giving them the opportunity to make an informed choice when you choose a toilet, right? So in that process, we ended up talking to a lot of folks who are engaged in this process, but most important in this whole approach. Now, this is a bit of an eye chart. I only show this to give you an idea. We have at Toto what we call the design review process. The design review process starts at, at DR0 and goes through DR5. DR0, we conceptualize the product we want to produce. DR5, it is coming off of production tooling. It's ready to ship to the customer, ready to go. Each one of those has a stage gate. Each one of those has a level of criteria and performance metrics that need to be achieved before it is allowed to go to the next stage for development. And in fact, here, in this little circle area here, we have two things. We have the LCA data on that product. My engineers are not allowed to bring a new product to launch unless its LCA is incrementally lower than the product it's replacing. Could be reducing the weight of the product, could be reducing the water, could be increasing recycled content, could be re reducing the distance that a material travels from a sub-tier supplier to bring it into our factory. All of those have impacts. And all of those need to be part of our decision process. In addition to that, we also have the living building challenge. We meet the requirements and meet the needs of the living building challenge. That questionnaire we fill out on every single product that comes out. And the living building challenge for me is sort of the uh, precursor to the HPD process. Now, this is what we have. You saw a little bit on Terry's slides. Uh, we actually have uh, five of these products that have already been full uh, transparency report developed. Uh, there's page one, we've got the marketing data, we've got some of the happiness going on there. We have a little bit of performance data, ADA compliant, 12 inch rough in, all the things that a plumber needs to know. But then we get into this section here where we actually talk about the environmental data, including the fact that this particular toilet is 21.5 millipoints. What does that mean? Most of our, matter of fact, I have to say 99% of the people that look at this report have no clue what 21 millipoints means. Now, there are some who get really excited about 21.5 millipoints. The sustainability experts at HOK, the sustainability experts at Gensler, uh, Perkins and Will, they get very excited. The folks at Scanza, the folks at Google. I mean, every time we go to visit Google, they wrap our arms around our neck and say, why can't more suppliers do what you're doing? That's a good position to be in, especially when we're asked by folks like Google, can you come and help participate in developing this as a standard program for Google and the healthy buildings product list that they have. Now, it gets even worse because, well, it gets better. Here we have the transparency report fully vetted with NSF and all the documentation for that. But here we get into you know, the, the LCA results, the scoping. We go into the issues of the life cycle stages and give a full detail of that. And then we get into the life stages and impacts, production, construction, use, end of life. And, and by the way, it's 14.2 millipoints, so use phase in the home is the highest. Still, even at 1.28 and at one gallon of flush. But here's where we get into the wonky details. And when we throw these Tracy details out there, most people's eyes sort of roll back in their head and they've had enough. What's most important is we have the data available. It may not be viewed as something that they understand, but they can see it. And in many cases, as Mark indicated, they check a box off. I got it, put it in the file, it's good to go. Now, that's all wonderful and good, and that's a nice document that we can provide our customers and help them make a decision. But we also want them to see a little bit about how we achieved that. And so we actually put some infographics in to make it a little bit easier for them to understand how did we get there. Now, we have a factory making to porcelain toilets, 20,000 toilets a month. In that factory, I have actually 
taken about 15% of my total energy produced, heat coming off of the kiln, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. We divert that heat over to another part of the factory and reuse it. We also have here, we are the single largest percentage users, user of green energy resources from Georgia Power. They took a case study, put it on their website, and pushed it around, helping to promote our brand. Then we went, and it's great making salesmen of our suppliers. And then we had 1.5 million gallons of gray water. It just goes on and on and on. And as you can see, all of these have an opportunity to help us improve our footprint, including the water energy nexus. Now, this conversation and this debate was so compelling that, and, and we talked earlier about Green Globes and about how many of the businesses around and, and buildings around the US are actually LEED certified. I can tell you right now that in Atlanta, Georgia, 70 million square feet in that space is under a program now called the Better Buildings Challenge. The Better Buildings Challenge is a DOE project to reduce the amount of energy consumed for that building. But Atlanta was kind of clever because Atlanta actually incorporated water into that program, recognizing this, because we've been talking to them. And I was actually asked uh, two weeks ago to go and visit at the UN Foundation, at the Future Energy Council, to actually speak about the water energy nexus and the importance to the Department of Energy in incorporating this into their metrics. Because when you reduce water, you reduce energy. And it's really important to recognize that impact. And let me show you an example of how that's impactful. Hartsfield Airport. We actually started a project with them a couple of years ago and helped convert their airport from 1.6 gallon toilets to 1.28 and one gallon urinals to half gallon urinals. We did it with some very interesting products like these. I'm sure you guys have seen some Toto um, commercial grade products. These products, again, you know those 1,500 engineers in Japan? As you flush that urinal or that toilet, it's all automatic. You walk up to it, you walk away, it flushes. As the water flows across that device, it spins a microturbine that makes energy that's then stored in a capacitor that then operates the unit for every subsequent use. It's off the grid. I mean, talk about taking it as far down off the grid as you can. The faucet do the same thing. Wash your hands in that faucet. As water flows across that faucet, it creates energy. It's parasitic. I mean, we're using the energy and the flow coming off that water, coming out of the tower, wherever it's at. But as that water flows across that device, we create energy. We then use that energy to operate the device. Off the grid, don't need to be wired up. It's spectacular. But by just changing those toilets at Hartsfield Airport, we help them save 3.6 million gallons of water a month. Now, when I ran that calculation for them, they were running 130,000 passengers per day through the airport. They're up to 142,000 passengers today, per day, through Hartsfield Airport. Not only are they saving water at 3.6 million gallons, 3.7 million gallons, but they're also saving, by the way, 13,600 kilowatts of electricity not generated per month. Now, Hartsfield Airport will not see their energy bill come down as a result of this. But who owns Hartsfield Airport? The city of Atlanta. Who supplies Hartsfield Airport with their water? The city of Atlanta. And when the city of Atlanta is not drawing water out of the Chattahoochee, pulling water out of the hooch, clean it up, make it drinkable, put it into the facility, flush it, put it back down, clean it up, put it back into the hooch, all that energy that they were consuming before is not being consumed. And they recognized early on that with the coal-fired power plant that they had at the time, they were generating 27,000 pounds of carbon a month. Now, Atlanta has a big challenge. We have lots and lots of trees in Atlanta. Combine the trees with the emissions coming out of the carbon plant, and you get ozone. And when you have ozone, you get non-attainment days. When they get non-attainment days, they lose federal funds for highways. It wasn't hard for them to put two and two together saying, I mean, I can save energy, not have to rebuild more water plants and add more, more business and, and energy to that. And I can hopefully get to a position where I can actually take enough consumption out to reduce the impacts on my non-attainment days during the summer. We got to do this. And even at a time in Atlanta when they were struggling hiring firemen and police officers, 
they invested in Toto products to put it into their space. So there's huge opportunities to see this impact. For me, the most important part of this is whether you're running airports in the US or across the world, or you're going to Vegas and, and looking at all the products they use there, these are all products that have helped them reduce their impact and help them reduce the water as well as the energy. But the most important part of this whole process is we've taken the opportunity of making the approach to running LCAs, doing the calculations, doing the analysis, streamlined it, made it easy enough to make decisions. I today make decisions about capital and investment that are predicated upon two things. Does it reduce my environmental impact? And can I cost effectively implement it and keep my cost low? And when I can do both at the same time, it's a double positive for me. I get the chance to put that equipment in place. So that is the opportunity to fully operationalize into your manufacturing process, into your design process, the use of LCAs to drive the decision points about how you run your business. And as Mark mentioned, we've actually gone up, vertically integrating up into our supply base. Some suppliers actually said, oh, we're not really sure how we're gonna do this, we're not, we don't know, and so we actually tried to help them understand it. There are several who not only embraced it, they wrapped their arms around it and said, you know what? We recognize that we as a supplier, if we do this work with you, that we'll be able to position our product as a greener solution for a material like clay. We have another one, a plastic manufacturer, who said, we will do this with you, we'll actually move it out. Not only did they take an effort to reduce their impacts, but they've also helped us reduce the consumption of PVC in our products and eliminate PVC to reduce the impact of the living building challenge. So these are all opportunities for us to be innovators, thought leaders, and to move forward with what is possible, especially as you integrate it. Now, one last thing. In my factory in Atlanta, Georgia, we speak seven different languages. Seven different languages in that factory. And I can tell you this, I have employees who are first generation Americans from Vietnam, from Indonesia, from South America, from Mexico, uh, from Africa, come in, don't speak really good English, but they tell me that they're proud to work at a company like Toto because of the things that we're doing. Now, when you get employees, first generation Americans, they didn't go to college, they didn't go to high school, but they come in and they're proud to be in that kind of a facility. I don't need to tell them, do a better job on quality, work harder. They're engaged at a visceral level to make the process and the business better. And that, you just cannot put a dollar sign on. So thank you guys very much.